Hello, my name is Lou Perosi, and welcome today to the next installment installment of Elements of Three Dimensional Design. And today we're going to be talking about time and how that relates to working with art. Um, so let's just get a little definition and really how it relates to three dimensional uh, design. Art exists in time as well as space. Time implies change and movement. Movement implies the passage of time. Movement and time, whether actual or illusion, are crucial elements in art, although we may not be aware of it. Um, and artwork may incorporate actual motion, that is, the artwork itself moves in some ways. Okay, so that's just sort of the formal definition of it. So why don't we talk a little bit about the illusion of movement? Okay, I think that's a good place to start when we're talking about time. Um, so what's the definition of illusion of movement? Artworks that, you know, they don't physically move through time and space, um, but gives the appearance that it is moving. Okay, so again, let's take a look at what that is. So where I would like to start is talking about illusion of space is sort of how it relates to representational art, okay? So they can be stylized or abstracted like we see over here in the unique forms of continuity in space, all right? Um, you know, so it's not exactly like a human figure, but we certainly feel that we read that as a human figure, right? So it becomes representational. So the most obvious one is if we take a look at Bernini's piece on the left, uh, there is this illusion of time. It's called the David, all right? And he's in a position where he's ready to throw his rock. And in a minute later, a second later, there's going to be an action. This figure is a sense of moving, uh, you know, throughout uh the piece will be moving here in a second, although obviously it hasn't changed for five, 600 years. And sometimes with movement, one way that really can help give a viewer uh, a sense of movement in an art piece is if we're using diagonal lines. So I want you to be aware of that. If you have a very static shape that actually, actually isn't going to move, the way to cheat that is using those sort of diagonal or curved lines. So in this case, look at how he is bent Okay, look at how his arm is bent, okay? And that'll really give you a sense for that. If we take a look at this piece in the middle, look at these horses, right? Again, they're stylized, uh, but we really read them as horses. They're just moving, they're just charging through time and space. Uh, again, we do see these diagonal lines. Here they are, they're represented. We do have some horizontal ones, but predominantly even the head is lined up in that way. Um, and so, that gets us uh, getting a sense that these objects are moving. And again, they're not ever really gonna move, right? If we take a look at this third piece uh, over on the right, again, we get a good sense of movement, how it relates to representational art. Again, we see these diagonal lines, right? Um, here's one here. Um, even in this head, if you follow that, that reads it just like that. So uh, there's a lot of diagonal lines going and again, it gives us that sense of movement. And that's how you can use it with represent, representational artwork. Uh, if we're talking about non-representational artwork, again, it's not like a car or a house or looks like a person. It isn't really anything that we relate in our known world that becomes non-representational. So if I said, you know, what are these objects? Uh, you, you probably don't know. Um, and here's another great example of if you make non-representational artwork or like to make non-representational artwork, diagonal lines or curvy lines, again, will work in your advantage. So here we see this really um, piece on the left. We see this beautiful curve that's happening, sort of like this loop. Again, we read this as sort of moving. If we take a look at this piece, we see these curvy lines. It also gives us a sense of moving. And underneath the surface, you can take a look at this piece to the right. We also have these curvy lines. And I think we probably realize that um, curvy lines and diagonal lines uh, give a sense of movement simply by if you think about, you know, how waves on water move, uh, how vines begin to grow, you know, they kind of curl 
curl up. And so I think early on, we probably get a sense that those things relate um, to movement. Those two things relate to movement. Okay, so let's talk about kinetic art. Artwork that is designed to move and change through time and space. And there can be a really a big range of this. And a lot of the things that I'm going to show you is really going to relate to kinetic art, um, especially if it's moving and changing through time and space. So think that as I begin to show you each one of these uh, images, they can be a couple of things in this category. So it can be kinetic art, they can be controlled time, they can be a few things. So it's not just one heading, certainly you can use a lot of different things. So let's take a look at John Tyler's piece. Uh, if, we look at, if we look at this piece, um, it's gonna, it changes through time and space. Here it appears very stationary. Again, we got this nice diagonal line, we got this curved line, we've got that going on. But this piece actually moves. So if we look at it, you know, we can see in, it, in its original position that I just showed you, then the sculpture can change to this, and then the sculpture can change to this, and then it can, can go to that. And so it becomes kinetic because again, it actually moves, okay? These are a little bit more easier and obvious. So if we look at this piece on the left, uh, wind allows it to move. It's gonna be very kinetic, right? Through short periods of time, it's gonna be moving a lot, especially the, as we have a lot of wind. Um, the artist in the middle, Alexander Calder, is really well known for what's called mobiles. Okay, mobiles are some, kind of these hanging things that do bend and move. And so these might go in a gallery or a home and they will just kind of move and change a bit. And again, they become very kinetic uh, in terms of, you know, how they might move a little bit. Uh, now, if we look at uh, Marcel Duchamp's piece, some people say this is a very early uh, piece of kinetic art. Some would say that and maybe even was the first. I'm not entirely sure about that, uh, but it's kinetic in some ways because uh, it takes the involvement of the viewer, but that tire, that wheel spoke actually turns, okay? And it may not turn in the wind, it may turn in the wind, I'm not, I'm not sure, but you know, that even that little bit of involvement still gives it, uh, unlike wind that's gonna be always moving, uh, this piece may need a little bit of interaction in order to move. Participatory sculpture in a lot of ways can bend and move. And uh, Richard, uh, Jesus uh, Soto is a great example. I think he's from South America. And he really invites people to be engaged in what his kinetic art is. He was a true pioneer. I think until recently, he became a much more popular artist in North America, but he was really famous in South America. And why this becomes kinetic is he invites people to go inside there and then the artwork begins to move and change, okay? So again, it's it gonna take some involvement on the viewer's part, but it will change and become a kinetic piece. You know, if you take a think about Bernini's piece I showed you, that stiff piece, that's not going anywhere, right? If you push up against it. I mean, unless you push really hard, maybe you'll knock it over. But um, certainly that's not going to move in the same way that this artist intends you just to get in there and be a part of the piece. I really, you know, when I started to put this PowerPoint presentation together, I found this piece to be really neat. Uh, as participatory sculpture. So it's this giant uh, balloon in some ways that's filled up with helium. And in, people ask the viewer to come in and move it around the room. And on these little spiky things is charcoal. And so it leaves all of these markings along the different walls as it sort of floats and gets pushed through the room. I thought this is just really neat as an installation piece, right? Taking a gallery or a space and creating a piece of art. Um, and here we can kind of see it. You got your little doorway and then this person's just taking this and spinning it. It's leaving marks on the ceiling. It's leaving marks on the hallway and on the floor. And you know, this is, this is very, very kinetic. And the, the, uh, the artist really wants you to be able to do that. Um, and it's called, it, the title of it is ADA. Um, another way we can 
sort of talk about uh, time is artwork that is designed to move and change through a predetermined sequence of events. Okay, so again, let's let's think about artwork that is designed to move through a predetermined sequence of, event, of events. And so if we take a look at uh, Bruce Shapiro's pieces, these are tables. I think he has a magnet or in here. I'm not exactly sure on how he does this. Um, but he has a marble that literally moves throughout the piece and changes the imagery. So if you notice, these are each very different. And then it goes through this predetermined set of what it's going to do. And it creates these really sort of beautiful designs uh, on the surface, right? These nice textures um, really relating to um, and predetermined designs. They're so well organized and so... Um, uh, symmetrical in terms of its design or radial design, you know, we know that this is sort of this controlled time. Uh, I'm from Chicago uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, was born and raised in Chicago. And one of the things I'd like to do is go down to O'Hare uh, Airport. So if you ever get a chance um, to go to the O'Hare Terminal, and maybe many of you will, they have these sort of neon uh, they have this one area where you get on one of these, uh, I forget what, uh, and you go through and the lights change and the artwork literally changes different colors as you sort of pass from uh, one terminal to the next. Um, and again, it's, it's predetermined. The artist knows exactly what color combination is coming and it, it's just going to continue to repeat itself again and again. Um, and so that's really control time. And, in, and the artwork takes time um, in order to exist, right? Another thing we want to talk about is kinetic sculpture performance. It's artwork that only exists only for one performance. Okay, So we want to think about a piece that's just, it starts and ends. Um, not a great picture, but one of the better ones that I could find. It's called Homage to New York, a self-constructing uh, and self-destroying artwork of art. And it's interesting because the artwork actually moved. Uh, there's like a little wagon that's being pulled and, you know, these, these, uh, these little spokes and things would turn. But ultimately, it caught on fire and destroyed itself. And here, if you look on the picture to the right, I think the artist has a, a fire extinguisher kind of dying it out. So again, it only existed for, you know, one performance, one moment, and then it just disappeared. Um, let's talk a little bit about performance art now. So this is sort of the next title that we can kind of get into. An artist sets up or conducts uh, a live experience for their audience, okay? Again, what is um, performance art? Um, an artist sets up or conducts a live experience for their audience. And so um, JJ McCracken had nine models or people participate in, I mean, there's a video record of this, um, but had nine people do this uh, sort of this performance art in which People, it was called hunger, and people were eating these, you know, pieces. I think they were clay, and then they, they put themselves in clay, um, and you know, they, they people would move around the room and do all sorts of stuff. It's a great example of really a performance art, um, you know, just kind of an interesting combination of things. And so again, these people are moving. It's a performance. Once it ends, it's kind of over. Right? It's kind of like going to the theater. That's a great example of performance art. Um, this one's kind of interesting. Maybe you, you heard about it. It was art, at Art Basel in Miami. And there was this banana installation that was worth $120,000. So it was a banana that the artist had found, um, I think, at the local grocery store in Miami and put a piece of duct tape that they got it from, uh, from um, you know, a... Uh, a hardware store and another artist came in and like literally you know tore it off the wall and ate the banana 
So, you know, was this by chance? I, I'm, I'm thinking this wasn't an accident, right? I mean, so it was in some ways a performance piece. I don't know if the artists ever really came out and said that it was, but it was interesting enough that it actually made all the nightly news and kind of became a story. Uh, you know, this, this 120,000 banana with duct tape somebody ate. So it was kind of a little bit of a scandal, but I think it was more of a tongue in cheek uh, about it. So it was just, just a really neat little thing. The next thing we want to talk about is free time. You know, we, we all love free time, right? Um, artwork partially shaped by factors beyond the artist's control. These pieces will therefore vary somewhat randomly and unpredictably through, throughout time. So again, what's free time? Artwork that's partially shaped by factors beyond the artist's control. So let's kind of get into that a little bit. Um, this Robert uh, Smithson's Spiral Jetty. This is, I think this was done in the 70s, maybe 80s. I'm not exactly sure. It's an earthwork. I think it's a, a great example of a piece that uses free time. So the artist took all this dirt and, and sand and rocks and sort of built this spiral out in the middle of, I think, um, a lake. And then, and this is huge, by the way. So if you saw a person, a person would be very small. And why it's a good example of free time is that um, over time, that water is going to erode this away, right? So every day it's going to slowly fall apart. The tide is going to come in and it's just eventually just going to disappear. And so the artist doesn't know how long that piece is going to dissolve or disappear, but certainly these are factors that are not within the artist's control. He's just going to get in there, let this piece sort of happen, and then it's just going to change through time. Another good example of this is there's this event that's kind of neat. I've, I haven't been there, but it's called Burning Man. It's an event that's, that's uh, in Black Rock City in Nevada um, where all these artists come together and create all these different um, sculptures and stuff. And people pay, I think that you, you get a ticket and, you know, you, you get to like live out in the desert. And at the end of the event, I believe it's at the end of the event, they take a one of the figures, maybe even all of them, uh, but I know one for sure, and they burn it. And so the artist doesn't really know how it's going to, um, you know, dissolve or break. It relies on the flame, how it's going to fall apart. So there's this little thing of chance that we're not entirely sure how it's going to exist. And so let's just give it this as an example. So here's the, one of the pieces it's called... Um, Embrace Burn by the peer group. So a, a, a team of people, I think from out of based out of Nevada. And then they set it on fire and early on the eyes start to catch fire and then the head catches fire and then the whole thing catches fire and then it just slowly just caves in on itself. And again, the artist may not exactly know how it's going to fall. They may assume they know how it's going to fall or what it's going to do. But these factors are, you know, largely outside of their control. So the next thing we can talk about is timelessness. Artwork that transcends chronological time. Uh, certain designs last because they transcend uh, contemporary aesthetic trends to express more of a universal standard of beauty or truth. So let's just say that again. Artworks that transcend chronological time Certain designs last because they transcend contemporary aesthetic trends to express more universal standards of beauty or truth. And sometimes you can really see that if you go into somebody's house and you see like, you know, older stuff, like maybe it's 1980, you got like black, grand, uh, you know, like a really, you know, you know uh, I don't know, you know, fixtures that are very old and stuff. They give you a sense of time, but some things become really timeless. So let's just talk about that a little bit. So when I was at the Monkey Forest um, in Bali, I took this photo. Uh, this is a good example of a timeless piece, right? So if people a thousand years ago would know this is a, a cattle or, um, you know, some kind of cow. Um, and a thousand years in the future, people are going to also know that, right? So it becomes really timeless. 
Um, if we look at Michelangelo's David, which I always love to show this one, this is another really good example of timelessness because we know what the human body looks like, right? And so again, hundreds of years or a thousand years in the future or a thousand years in the past, we're going to relate to this piece because it's a human body and it just really becomes timeless. Look at the piece on the right. We look at the pyramids of Giza. It's one of the universal forms. Okay, what are universal forms? They're really found in nature. They're sort of um, uh, circles, ovals, uh, triangles. Now that's in, in two dimensional terms, but in three dimensional terms, they become what? Spheres. They become pyramids. Uh, they become, um, you know, cylinders. And in this particular case, we have a pyramid shape, right? And so that's going to be universal. Um, again, people are going to relate to that a thousand years from today. Talk about outside of time. So what does that mean? That seems like something out of a Doctor Who uh, episode, right? But the uh, way we want to think about it is that, you know, really some pieces are outside of time in a sense. Uh, that they are hardly to be said to exist until someone becomes involved with them. Okay, so it really takes somebody to kind of get in there and 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 involved. And so let's take a look at James Seawright's piece. A person comes in, and then the piece in some ways exists. It you could see your face in the image, uh, uh, in the artwork itself, which is a big part of the artwork. And so, again, it really takes that individual to step into the piece for it to really be a, a, a part of it. All right, so moving on, let's talk a little bit about viewing time. This is a really great way um, in which artists can really connect with this audience. So viewing time is it's really just kind of simple. It's how long a viewer spends time with a work of art. And and in our cat in our the way we want to think about time is the more we spend time with a you know, the more we're involved and we may spend time with a piece, the more it really relates to time. So let's let's kind of get into there. Um, again, I live from I live in Chicago and or northwest suburbs of Chicago and uh, a while ago at the Garfield conservatory which is a really a greenhouse that's um you know in in the city they put on a really neat show uh they put on they brought in the artist dal chihuly which is a glass artist and they created an art installation so here's an example different images of the event so what chihuly did is he put artwork all over this conservatory and everywhere you'd walk and move around it was kind of like an easter egg hunt looking for his work it sort of really complemented it, it really the the greenery uh of the plants um and they felt like harmonious with one another you really had to look at it and explore it and realize that this was a work of art but it took a while to walk through um, the conservatory. So you look in one way and there'd be these pieces, which is really interesting. Um, another piece like this coming out of this water area. And then you see these sort of balls um, on the piece on the right in the koi ponds. And again, there was just a lot of work there. Again, it took me a very long time. I think I probably spent a couple hours there just kind of looking at things. Um, just a really fascinating thing. I think if I remember correctly, and I could be wrong, I think at the same event, uh, they were hosting just a little side story. They were hosting a wedding and one of the patrons actually got drunk and knocked a piece like this over. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars. It was quite a, quite a big scandal. Um, and so I'm not really sure what happened to it, but it made the nightly news, uh, not a great way to get yourself on TV. Right. Um, Another piece in which we can sort of see a viewing time, I, I took this picture uh, when I was in Rome, uh, the, the Trajan column. And if you look at it, it tells about the history uh, of, uh, of this. And so if we look at these images to the right, it tells a story. Now, it's going to take you a long time to really go through it, right, to really walk around the column and go up and down and see the story that's trying to be told. So you're going to really spend a lot of time with this particular piece. Um, and again, 
that just really relates to viewing time. One of the things I like talking about with these elements of design, and I'm just going to kind of keep talking about this, is I think it's really neat that we can use these terms with pieces that were made thousands of years ago, all the way to the Neolithic period, or if it was made this morning. And you can incorporate them into your own artwork, right? As artists, we want to be thinking about this. How am I going to, if I engage my viewer with a lot of time, um, that's going to bring a lot of excitement to the piece. And I, I've done my job as an artist. Another uh, example of you know, spending a lot of time. I haven't been to this place. Um, this palace of Versailles, it's in France. And look at the size of these gardens, right? I mean, they're just massive. I consider this a work of art. There's sculptures everywhere. You know, there's fountains, even the way the plants are designed. Um, you know, even these patterns in the grounds, it's just a beautiful, really work of art. But if we look at this piece on the right, look at how big these gardens are. It's going to take you a tremendous amount of time to go through this. And again, that just really relates to viewing time. So when we look at Del Chihuly's pieces, the piece I showed you at the Garfield Conservatory, that was about maybe five or six years ago. I'm not really sure when the date was, or this was like the 1600s, right? So... Uh, artists, a uh, group of artists can work together collaboratively to create these pieces in which we view time. Um, well, anyway, I hope you enjoyed my presentation on the element of three-dimensional uh, design, which related to time. Again, my name is Lou Perosi. I want to give special thanks um, to the group that wrote uh, Shaping Space, helped me to sort of organize everything uh, in a nice, clear, and concise manner. Um, and again, I, uh, I, uh, wish you the best. So have a, have a great day. Um, thanks again and talk to you later.